So uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, I wanted to just take this opportunity to go through a, um, a unit test for um, the ITE GPIO driver um, that I recently wrote before adding a new feature, because I think that it could be a useful pattern that we could copy for other tests uh, for device drivers, uh, which is an area of the code base, which is seems to have quite a lack of um, tests. Let's just start out with a little philosophy here. Um, you know, ideally, you've probably seen this pyramid before. Ideally, we should have like a few manual tests or automated tests that run on real hardware, a greater number of integration tests that sort of check things end to end. And then what we should have the most of is unit tests, right? And, and why is that? Because the unit tests are fast, they're stable. Um, we run them, you know, we block pull requests on them in the Git lab, GitHub uh, continuous integration system. The integration testing, uh, there are some of those, you know, and that in, I would include QMU testing in that same category. Uh, I believe those are run nightly on GitHub, but they don't actually block pull requests from coming through. And then, of course, uh, testing on real hardware, is it's very good. Like, you know for sure that your code works. But the problem there is, you know, it's not run automatically, so you don't get the same level of feedback. And it's very hard to uh, test negative situations where you get error codes and such because you, you can't fake out what the real hardware is doing. Uh, so that's generally why you want things in a pyramid structure. But what we have on Zephyr looks a little bit more like this right now. Um, we have a few tests that are run on real hardware and there's very little for um, for unit tests. And here are some common excuses, right? And this one in bold, um, well, it just can't be done. There's just no way to inter intercept these uh, register accesses. This is the one that I want to talk about today because I think we've got a, um, th th this is a potential mechanism to do this. Um, the, the, where it says drivers there, if you download the slides from the um, schedule, uh, that link takes you over to codecoverage.io, where Zephyr has uh, all the coverage metrics for the various portions of the system. You'll see that things like kernel and uh, Wi-Fi are pretty well tested, and the other things not so much. It is a little bit misleading, though, if you look at the code coverage dashboard, because it only includes, you know, if it says like 50 out of 100 lines are covered by the tests, that 100 lines only include the files that were linked into a test. So if there's, you know, one test and it tests one file and there's 99 files that don't get tested, that might still show up as 100% test coverage even though most of the files never even got compiled. So uh, just be aware if you're looking at the coverage dashboard that it can be misleading. Uh, so let's dig into this case study here. So we had a desire here at Google. Uh, yeah, I guess I should have mentioned that. I, I'm on the Chrome OS team at Google uh, working on the embedded controller firmware my focus is primarily run around testing, hence the topic here of this talk. Uh, the ITE chip, its GPIO controller does not support level-based interrupts, only edge-triggered interrupts. And we really wanted level-based trigger, level-based interrupts. And so the goal here was, well, if we could emulate level-based interrupts in the driver, then we wouldn't have to keep implementing this over and over again uh, with every new device that uses an ITE chip that we ship. So I went looking at this device driver to try to find, you know, where, what is some technique that we could use to capture those reads and writes to 
the registers um, so that we can actually unit test this code. And I found this macro, EC reg. This was pre-existing in the, the ITE code base, right? This was not something I added, but it was not used in the GPIO driver. So I went ahead and wrapped every register access, as you can see in the before and after section with this macro. It doesn't really change anything, right? It's just doing a cast and dereference there. Um, and potentially, you know, it could have, might be a little more readable if we had separate read and write macros. Uh, but in this case, I was aligning it with the code base that was already there for the other drivers for the same chip. So I just left it as EC reg. Um, and then I created a, a, a native SIM test. I tried to use the unit test driver in CMake, um, and that did not work out well for me. Uh, native SIM did what I wanted, which is on a right on a POSIX system, it would include that device driver as long as it showed up in my DTS overlay, um, but everything else would be simulated. The unit test if you choose that as your board type, um, it only then includes the files that you explicitly list in your CMake file. And uh, so then you can't call any functions in the kernel. In this case, I wanted to use work, worker queues. And so uh, unit test didn't really work for me, but native sim worked out just fine. Uh, so yeah, in my config file, I made sure this driver was enabled. And I made sure I put in an entry uh, for the a GPIO controller into my DTS overlay. Now, it depends upon an, an interrupt controller. So I just went ahead and used the virtual interrupt controller that you would normally use in a native SIM test. Uh, and that, that worked fine. As for all these register values and the other settings, I just copied those from the ITE uh, chip overlay that's that's used for when you're developing real code for the ITE um, system. And uh, so then I got a right. If if this was all I did, then I would have ended up with a test that when it made GPIO calls, uh, it would try to write to those memory addresses and it would get a segment fault. Right. So the next step um, was just getting the thing to, to build because the the GPIO driver code depends upon a bunch of ITE specific headers, which are not normally in the search path for a native SIM test. So I adjusted the include path to include the ITE common and the ITE you know, eight XXX2 specific headers. That almost took care of things, except for the uh, arch cpu.h file. I was not successfully able to import that header directly because it had a bunch of conflicting things in there. So instead I created my own within the test, but since my include directory came first in the search path, it used my file instead of using the ITE ones. And then from there, I included uh, a POSIX arch.h file to, to get most of the missing function calls that I needed. And then the, uh, the IRQ connect dynamic uh, function here, I was just unable to pull in the header that defines that function. So I declared a forward declaration for it in this file. Like, there's probably a more elegant way to do this, but um, this was a way to do it. We're dealing with a situation here where we're building on POSIX, right? But we actually want to execute some chip specific code. And so it just takes a lot of glue logic here to get these things to cooperate with one another. But fortunately, you know, I only had to do this once, right? We could have any number of tests that could share this, this same structure here. 
Um, but presumably you would need to do this same sort of gluing for each chipset that you wanted to do some driver specific testing for. The next step then was I over, I replaced that chip chip reg.h, which is where that EC reg macro got defined to, um, so in my copy of it, I include the ITE version of the file. Then I replace their definition of EC reg with one that calls a function instead of just dereferencing a pointer. And then I forward declared that function, which then I provide within my test to take all those register accesses and point them at fake registers that I'm going to use later. Now, ultimately, you know, how, how good is this test going to be? How realistic is it? It really depends on what kind of assertions you check in the test. GPIO drivers are really quite simple. Um, you know, for the most part, you, you do a pin config and you verify to make sure that all the registers got set as expected. There's just not a lot to it. And then here, it's kind of small, but uh, here's my implementation of this fake EC reg function. And so for each register, um, I redirect it to a variable. And then when it's written to by the driver code, then I can verify that uh, the correct side effects happened. Um, so on the left here on the screen is a, a snippet from one of the tests where I, I call GPIO pin configure with some various flags. And then I just check the three registers that would normally be affected by that uh, based on the data sheet for the chip. Um, it is kind of important if you're writing these tests to definitely check the data sheet and not just read the code. Right. Otherwise, you might put the same bug into both the test and the driver, and then you're not really testing anything. So I call pin configure. I verify that the registers got set correctly. Now we know pin configure is working. The other thing that I tried to do here is uh, call as high level functions as possible. Right. In this case, I'm calling GPIO pin configure, not calling the specific function exported by this particular driver. Um, and that's mostly because of these, the GPIO driver, the boilerplate code that all the drivers use implements this concept of a logical pin, right? And if I just called directly into the driver, I would miss that, that logic setting of, uh, you know, treating active as low so it's it's in it's basically inverting the value of the GPIO on every call here because I asked it to be active low. So that's a very basic overview of the test. I did have one situation here where it was a little bit more complicated because there's the there's one particular register that when you write to it. Uh, and then you read from it, the, the, the driver code expects that whatever you wrote to the register then disappears. So in this case, since I, my macro doesn't actually know whether or not you're going to write to the register or read from the register, I have this flag in here, register clear uh, GPCR before read. So on every, every time that register is requested, I go ahead and zero out um, the values, which mimics what the real register does. Because you write to it, and then uh, when you read from it, uh, it, it just reads zero. OK, so there's some limitations here, right? As I mentioned, um, because my macro doesn't know if you're reading or writing. 
it is difficult to intercept the reads. For this particular driver, that wasn't a big problem, uh, but I can see that how, you know, if I was doing this in like a greenfield development where I wasn't trying to preserve existing behavior, I would definitely use two separate macros for reading and writing. The set one in the production code would just be like star register equals value. And the read one would just cast it to a const uh, pointer and then dereference it Vers versus in the test, then that would call two separate functions, one to simulate a read and one to simulate a write. The other danger here is that um, because all I'm doing is we we call uh, we call into the driver with something like GPIO pin configure, and then we look at the side effect. If you're not really careful to actually think about what scenarios are important and what side effect do we need to check, it's very easy to end up just writing your test to be the same as the code, and um, then you have a test that works as coded. And if anything changes in the test in the in the driver, the test breaks until you make the same adjustment there. Where ideally you'd be checking things at a high enough level of abstraction that simple refactors in the code wouldn't actually break your test. And that gives you some confidence that your refactor then had no effect like you were expecting. So yeah, I was definitely trying to be careful not just to use the code as my guideline and um, and go off the data sheet. Um, there's also no emulator device in this scenario, right? This is just a unit test. If I wanted to do a bigger integration test where the GPIO usage was only a small part of it, um, I wouldn't be able to do that here. Now, probably that's fine for the most part, because native SIM has a very nice GPIO emulator that um, is very full featured and it works very much like real hardware does, but there could be some differences. Like for example, you know, ITE chips only supporting edged based interrupts and the native SIM emulator, it will support edge based or level based interrupts. So you could trick yourself, which is what this diagram on the side is trying to represent, right? If you have a whole bunch of different tests, all testing things at different levels of the system, you might think, well, it's fine because I tested the driver to the hardware and I tested, you know, some other logic down to the GPIO layer. And I tested, you know, my high level logic against my lower level logic and it all overlaps. So even though it's lots of separate tests, I have good confidence that it works. But if you have a gap there where there is actually no overlap, um, your, your test that's checking against the registers, you know, might not be the same as the test that's checking against the emulator. So that's a, that's another possible way to shoot yourself in the foot um, and not realize it. There is definitely, we could create a way to make an emulator. It would be a lot more work. Uh, basically, we would need to uh, treat these, these macros that redirect the register accesses as basically as its own subsystem. Think of it like a, a memory redirection subsystem um, and that you could turn on even on real hardware and to force the calls to go to an emulator instead of going to uh, the real hardware. And, and then you'd be able to make a larger integration test. But I think for, in this case, it wasn't really necessary. Ultimately, what was my goal? Um, you know, I didn't want to just make a test for the sake of making a test. I wanted to have confidence that when I implemented this new feature of level interrupt emulation um, in the driver that it actually worked. So uh, I didn't have an IT development board in order to try this out. Um, so it wasn't convenient to try it out on, on real hardware. Uh, 
so I implemented it with 100% unit test coverage. I, well, I got to 100% unit test coverage before I implemented my feature. Then I added the feature and made sure that the new code also had 100% test coverage. Um, and that let me verify, because I was using native SIM as the board, I was able to use work queues and the various other features of the Zephyr kernel uh, in the test, just like the driver does. And so I was able to verify that. Uh, native SIM has interrupt handlers. Uh, so in my test, I can say, you know, set up the interrupt handler and then set the registers as if the interrupt was firing. And then you tell native SIM, okay, trigger the interrupt for this particular interrupt, this emulated interrupt controller. And then the GPIO driver picked that up and uh, it retried until the level went down and it all worked just as expected in the testing. So recently we had a brand new Chromebook launch uh, that we were working on. And uh, I, we had two devices sharing a GPIO and it was one of these situations where it's like, oh, it sure would be convenient if we could just set this to level-based interrupt triggering. So we did, and it worked first try. Um, so I think this was a good success story for uh, unit test first uh, driver development, right? Or at least a feature development. Uh, it passed in the test, and then we tried it out on, on the hardware, and, and it worked just like we thought it would. Um, yeah, that's all I have. It looks like we have about eight minutes remaining here for questions. So um, if someone wants to unmute the room and... Hey, Jeremy. I was just curious. Yeah. Uh, would um, installing like a handler for the segmentation fault uh, signal, would that have been another alternative to uh, basically catching these memory accesses and attempting to uh, validate them? I think that would work. I don't know. The, the trouble, though, is that like on a POSIX system, page faults are going to happen at the page level, not at the individual register level. So I think that would only let you intercept the first access unless you were explicitly unmapping the page again then after every single access. Okay, well, cool. thanks. And what if those register addresses happened to be valid for something else? Then you would end up just overriding whatever data happened to live at that address. Cool, thanks. Hi, I had a quick question on, um, I'm, I'm not really familiar with native SIM, but when talking about GPIO drivers, obviously, you know, outputs are driven from your from your code and your tests. How did you handle the the input side and, and getting activations and that sort of thing in that in that environment for your unit test? So the unit test for testing inputs, it just, it sets all the chip registers as if an input was coming in, the emulated registers. Uh, and then um, triggers the interrupt, and then the driver will fire, read the GPIO state from the fake registers, and um, then we verify in the test that the correct logical value comes back. Cool, that makes sense, thank you. Because ultimately a GPIO driver, right, it's just comparing a set of hardware registers with some logical state. And um, we don't have, you know, it's a test, so we don't have the physical lines, but we can make those registers be in any possible state that we want to simulate and, and verify that the driver does the wrong thing, the correct thing, including simulating error conditions that might never happen in real life, but we could at least see what the code would do if the registers got into those very strange situations. Yeah, so one question I have is, did you consider if it's possible to mess with the linker, maybe actually put some symbol or section memory we control at the 
address of the memory app per peripherals? Or is there too much risk of overlap or conflicting with something that has to be at that address? I don't think that under when you're building for POSIX, you don't get 100% control over the layout of your binary. So no, I didn't try that. Uh, any other questions for Jeremy? All right, I, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Jeremy. All right, and uh, yeah, download the slides uh, on every page there. I have links in the code snippets to over to GitHub where the full code is. I hope that this um, unit test can be a model that other people might want to copy from, um, and maybe it will save you a little time when trying to write your own device driver tests. All right, thank you. Thank you.